tell us about the damage done in your words. Well, I guess um, the story of the damage done is about a woman named Lily Moore, who is a travel writer. She's been living in Spain uh, for the past year, and she's called home to New York suddenly when she's told that her sister's died. Um, basically, that her sister has drowned in a bathtub on the anniversary of their mother's suicide. And Lily at first is really traumatized by the news, but when she goes back to New York, she immediately discovers that it's not her sister who died, it's another woman who turns out to have stolen her sister's identity and who was in her sister's apartment, and her sister's missing. And partly because of the timing of the death, um, the fact that it was on the date of their mother's suicide, um, Lily is suspicious that her sister may have been involved in the death, um, though she's also concerned that something might have happened to her, and she starts looking for her. Um, the police also start looking for Claudia because they just see her as a suspect and someone who might have had a hand in the death of the other woman. But that would be just a, an outline of it. Now you worked in journalism, and now you're releasing your debut in fiction. So talk about how novel writing compares to journalism work. Well, maybe the best way I can describe it, I've worked in journalism for 12 years uh, in terms of being a freelance writer and I was on staff at magazines for a couple of years before that and I loved writing in journalism because it let me write about a lot of different things, it let me talk to a lot of different people, it um, gave me a chance to travel which is something that I loved. But there was never anything in journalism that really absorbed me or obsessed me, like writing a novel. Um, when I started working on The Damage Done, there were strange things that started happening where I would have my head so much in the book that I would lose track of things in real life. And um, I literally, uh, there was a time when I was going to a friend's apartment. It was a friend I've known for years, you know, visited her apartment countless times. We were in a writer's group together. And I got lost on the way there. I was wandering up and down streets in Soho trying to find it. And what had happened was that I was looking for a location for Jesse's apartment, Lily's best friend in the book. And I had gotten so into that that I lost track of reality and my husband accuses me of walking into traffic when I'm working on a book. It happens with short stories too but to a lesser extent because it only takes me um, usually a day or two days to do a first draft of a story whereas the first draft of a novel for me is about three months and I'm so completely um, obsessed with it that it's actually hard to remember to do basic things. My apartment is a disaster, um, you know, I will just not care about mess and then when I come out of that phase I'll be amazed by the chaos around me and, and will have wondered how that all happened. But it actually takes up my brain in a way that journalism, um, journalism never did. There. The Damage Done is your first fiction book but you've published travel books prior to this. What got you started in travel writing? Oh, um, I guess the very beginning of that, when I went freelance, I got some really good advice from a wise editor friend who'd been in the business for years. And what he told me was that when you're a freelancer, it's always a struggle because you don't know where your next check is coming from. And so he was saying, line up steady gigs that will let you know that you're going to eat. And I took him very literally because the first steady gig that I lined up was a restaurant reviewing um, job with Toronto Life magazine. It was a freelance job, but I was reviewing a certain number of restaurants for them every month. And it was terrific because not only did I get to feed myself, um, it was a job that allowed me to take a friend with me. It, you know, you look very suspicious as a reviewer if you show up and you're not eating with anyone. So it allowed me to take a friend out. And um, that led almost directly into me writing the Fromers Toronto City Guide. Um, I wrote the first edition of that in 2000. And one of the things that they really liked was that I was a restaurant reviewer and that at that point I'd reviewed, um, I think it was something like 400 restaurants. So I had a really kind of um, solid background. And I'd also been writing about the arts. Um, so I knew the theater scene and the art scene and um, nightlife, side trips, there were a lot of things that I'd written about. So that was the first Fromer's Guide. And once you start writing guidebooks, um, 
if they find that um, you're dependable, you turn the book in on time because they're on a very tight time schedule, they will actually start offering you other books. So over the years, I've been tempted to do um, different books, um, you know, go to the Bahamas and write a book <laughs> and do these things. But the truth is, it takes a lot of time to put together a guidebook and to do it well. So the only books that I've written have been about Toronto and about New York, which are both places I've lived. And um, I've co-authored a book on Canada, um, I guess it's four times now. So really all of the books that I've done have been in that vein. Um, I write about the places that I know best. And then in magazine articles, I've written about more exotic places. With the more exotic places you've been able to visit, what would you say is your most exciting one? Oh, the one that thrilled me the most was Easter Island. That one was a place that I had dreamed about going for a very long time. I was um, really into, when I was younger, um, well, actually now too, um, archaeology in, in kind of a silly Indiana Jones way, but being really thrilled by sort of ancient secrets and statues and um, stories. And Easter Island is one of those strange places where there are lots of theories about what went on there, but not much information. So. Uh, people have theories about how the Moai, which are those large stone statues, um, how they were moved across the island because there's really just one quarry, one volcano that they came from. But nobody really has an idea. And there are these um, ancient stories about how the Moai walked across the island, which is kind of funny. Someone tried to prove that you could roll them along logs and make them look like they were walking and that it was a way to get them from place to place. I don't know, but it all made me intrigued about going there and, and seeing the island. My very favorite place I visited, though, has been Peru, um, which I was there for three weeks and absolutely loved it. There have been all kinds of amazing places that I've visited, but Peru really had this combination of sort of the great mythology, you know, Inca mythology and stories, Inca ruins, um, colonial architecture. Um, there was this whole school of art called the Cusco School of Art where European painters came over to train native artists and they produced amazing work and the only galleries that have them are in Peru and I mean I was dying to take pictures of them. I may have snuck a few photos I wasn't supposed to because you're not allowed to do that but sometimes you just have to. They don't have any books available with these photographs. It's just or with these pictures. It's um, one of those tough things. They have amazing food, amazing landscapes. Um, and my next novel is actually set in Peru, so I'm now putting that kind of that research to, to good use. The damage done, actually, though, is set in New York. And after visiting all these beautiful places and being originally from Toronto, what made you decide that your first novel was going to be set in New York? It's funny because it was so instinctive. I feel like there should have been this kind of great um, decision-making process that I went through because, uh, you know, different places I could have set the novel and Lily's a travel writer but it just felt um, to me that New York was where Lily was from when I started thinking about the character and what she was like um, it was something that was just maybe intuitive would be the best way to describe it because it wasn't a conscious choice and having her um, live on the Lower East Side, for instance, wasn't really a conscious choice either. Um, part of that was because Lily is someone who is very stuck on the past in a lot of ways. She loves vintage clothes and old music. Um, her favorite singers would be Billie Holiday and Sarah Vaughan um, and Ella Fitzgerald. And she gravitates even to these um, older pieces of um, electronics, for instance. She has this old phone in her apartment that you can't even hook up an answering phone to. Um, it's actually, I think I admitted this when I guest blogged for you, Jen, but it's actually the same phone my grandmother had in her apartment in Toronto. But Lily really connects with older things, and I felt that she connected with the Lower East Side because, in a way, that neighborhood contains so much of the history of New York in it. It's changed so much from being a ghetto um, to sort of gentrifying and then suddenly becoming so trendy and, and um, is now really a battleground between people who want to preserve the historic nature of the neighborhood and people who want to knock it down because they'd like to build new buildings. Well, another element that's very important to represent New York and make sure that that city is authentic in the story is the vast array of 
different types of characters, whether it be by age or by ethnicity or by um, race. And you've represented that a lot in the different characters that are in the book. But how do you go about making sure you keep those characters authentic? That's such a great question because I think it would be incredibly easy just to go into stereotypes and to, um, to sort of let a character be very two-dimensional. I, I actually tried to play with stereotypes, though. One of the main characters in the book is um, Tariq Lawrence, who is the former boyfriend of Claudia, Lily's sister. Um, he is from Pakistan. Um, his father was British and his mother was Pakistani. And he lives in New York, though he also has a home in Pakistan. And he's really caught between two worlds. I mean, he's really, he's experienced um, Britain and America and has lived in both those countries and been educated there. But his family is largely still in Pakistan. And in the book, I tried to explore his character, but also um, assumptions that people have about people from Pakistan because that country has become such a, um, in the news, it's synonymous now with terrorism, with which if you have any Pakistani friends, if you know people from that country, that is not in any way the nature of the country. You're talking about, you know, several thousands of people who support terrorism who are there, but you're not talking about an entire country that, um, you know, that, that supports that. So, but I wanted to explore, you know, in the news, how would this be covered? And there are things that are written about him in the book that, that um, you know, do kind of immediately jump on, oh, he's from Pakistan. Oh, well, you know, clearly this must go on our suspect list. Um, so he's one example of someone who I was, I was interested in exploring that character. And he is a very, um, to me a unique character because he is caught between the two worlds and so for instance um, he's very English in so many ways in the way that he speaks and in the way he decorates his apartment and that sort of thing and yet there are these um, kind of uh, family relationships that are um, extremely important to him that maybe you know, other people living in America don't feel the same kind of need to, you know, go and avenge a family member, that kind of thing. He actually does feel, um, you know, that he has to do that. Another character who um, was really interesting to write because he's from another place was Jesse, who is from Oklahoma. And so not as much of a, of a different location as Tariq's, but a place that so much has its own character and has its own stories and is, I feel like, a really unique place within the U.S. Um, and in a way, he kind of plays up his Oklahoma roots. I mean, he is very fond of quoting Will Rogers. He has a huge amount of pride in where he's from. And I kind of liked writing about him in a way that um, so many New Yorkers that I meet are from these other places. And they tend to be very quiet about where they're from. They come to New York and they don't really talk about their roots. Jesse really embraces his. And it comes out in sometimes um, these thoughtful ways. There's a religious background that he has that is very important to him. And, you know, he will quote the Bible in a way that I don't really know very many people <laughs> doing. Um, and, you know, that's just part of his nature and part of his character. So I guess it's it's knowing um, partly you have a character that you want to write about and who has a certain role in the book, and you want to explore that character, look at the things that influenced them when they were growing up, and then also look at the stereotypes that exist about them. I mean, if you when you read the book, you'll notice that Jesse's language, when he's around certain people, he'll really emphasize his Oklahoma accent and, you know, the way that he talks, he'll sort of play that up because he is aware of how people respond to it and he's sort of daring someone to look at him as stupid for doing that.